Okay, um, I think we're at time, so I'm just going to get started. Uh, thanks all for joining in. What I'm going to be talking to you guys today is about is why we should look to optimize beyond agile teams. Um, I'm going to take questions at the end, but if you guys have any questions, please just ping them in the, the Q&A box and, you know, as they come to you throughout the talk, and then I'll get to as many as I can at the end. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Maria Connor. I'm working as an agile coach in a company called Workday. I'm based in Dublin in Ireland, and I work in an organization called Customer Deployment Tools, uh, CDT for short. You'll hear me referencing that a lot throughout the talk. Um, just a little bit about us in CDT. So we are 90 people. Uh, we're spread across three locations. So in Dublin, Ireland, and we also have teams in the US in Salt Lake City and also in Pleasanton. Um, our teams use Kanban to manage the flow of work across the teams, but for this talk, for, what, for the story I'm going to share today, that's actually not, um, it's not really relevant because, you know, if you guys could look at this in terms of if your teams were doing Kanban, Scrum, or just kind of do it, they're just doing the work. Um, for me as an Agile coach, I guess, look, you know, I was on Scrum teams, I've been on teams that practice Kanban, and I, I feel like a lot, a lot of Agile conferences, we talk a lot about teams and improving the teams and, you know, making teams agile, transforming teams, improving the flow of work on teams. But teams are really just a part of an overall system. And for us in CDT, it's about how those kind of 13 teams work together to deliver value. And that's really the system that we've ended up looking at improving. And I think when you kind of go up a level beyond the team and start to look at the, the organization as a whole, I think that's kind of how you get to true business agility. I'm going to kind of start with where we've actually ended up. <laughs> um, this is where we are now. We didn't start with any such grandiose notions as, oh, let's make our organization or our business agile and not our teams. We kind of ended up here out of necessity. So, you know, as we were kind of trying to scale out, we kept coming up against problems that weren't necessarily manifesting themselves in the teams. It was more in the organization and how the teams kind of work together to deliver value. So we ended up having to kind of go up a level and zoom out and look at the organization as a whole and sort of make the intangible tangible, like start to see, well, how does the work actually flow through the organization? How are we actually making decisions as an organization? Now, some of you might kind of look at this and say, oh, that looks like flight levels. And actually, in some respects, it is. And we've definitely taken a lot from Klaus. So thank you to Klaus. Um, but this is kind of where we've ended up. And I wanted to just tell the story as to kind of how we got here. So that's what I'm going to do today. But before we do that, I just wanted to do a quick poll with everyone who's here just to kind of get a sense of who you guys are and, and where you guys are coming from, uh, maybe with the framing of this story. So, Theo, could you launch the, the poll there and we'll get it going? Yes. Thank you very much. Big thanks to Theo as well for being the producer on this. Great help. Okay, cool. So there, there's kind of a, a good enough spread. Like I think the, the majority of people are saying that they visualize the work on Agile teams. That's cool. Uh, there's a couple of people as well that do it for a whole organization and that's great. So yeah, going back to, I guess, how did we end up there? Going back to the beginning of our story, we started with what I would term as a pretty um, typical agile adoption across the teams. We started with one team and that team adopted the practices of Kanban. They you know, started to visualize their workflow. They started to look for bottlenecks in that workflow, blockers. They applied whip limits. They created a pull system and they just generally started to improve the flow of work on the team. Uh, when I say copy paste here, I'm not trying to talk about homogenizing people or process. It's more just those practices that worked well on one team, we started to apply them to other teams. And eventually all 13 teams were actually, you know, practicing, had adopted those practices of Kanban and we're starting to see optimi optimizations in their workflow. And, you know, it should have been, well, that's it, right? We're done. We're agile. But, but that wasn't the case, right? That certainly didn't feel like the case. We still actually had a lot of problems um, that we couldn't necessarily see, I guess, to describe it, we could kind of more feel them. We could feel that there was maybe too much work in our system. We could feel that maybe, you know, we weren't um, always clear as to where things were at. We just didn't have that view. Like, for example, some problem spaces, actually multiple teams were working on them and it might be three or four different teams working on a problem space. And to try and get a view of where this problem space was at, you had to go and talk to three or four different people and get three or four different answers. Um, so really for us, you know, we decided, look, there's some problems here that are intangible. We need to try and make them tangible. We need to zoom out a level. We need to try and see, you know, what's actually going on at an organizational level. So in order to kind of create that bigger picture, this was our first very rudimentary attempt at that. 
what we did was we just went around to each of the teams and asked, look, what are the big ticket items? You know, what are the main kind of problem spaces you guys are looking to solve for at the moment? Um, it's a very much kind of a proto Kanban system. I mean, there was some sort of workflow there, but not really well defined. Um, but what it did give us is we could actually start to see, okay, for each of the teams, these are the most important things that the teams are working on. These are the things that we really need to talk to. Uh, unfortunately, I took this photo a couple of months in where we'd actually started to try and refine the system a bit. But when we first actually put all the post-its up, I mean, I'm talking about teams of like four to six people. Some of those teams had six, eight, 10 kind of, you know, major problems that they were trying to solve. And I, our initial reaction to this board was, man, like that's a lot of things. That's a lot of work that's going on. And we started to think to ourselves, look, all of those kind of good practices that we had applied at a team level in terms of, you know, trying to manage the flow of work and, you know, defining the workflow and looking at bottlenecks. Could we do the same to this system, right? Could we actually evolve that to be more of like a Kanban type system? And that's what we did. And so we call this the CDT Work in Progress Board. And I, I'm not going to talk through this board in any great detail, but if you guys are curious and you want to kind of talk through it in more detail, I'll be in Sokoko for the afternoon. But just to illuminate for a bit of context to, to the story, when we put the work up, we could start to see like, you know, there was a lot of it. So that was one of our initial things is we felt the system was overloaded. So we wanted to try and, you know, reduce the work down, the amount of work there that was in the system. We wanted to encourage the teams as well to really focus on finishing work rather than starting new work. So as the team would finish something, you know, rather than going to pull something new in, see if there was an opportunity maybe to help another team somewhere in the organization to finish what they were doing. It also gave us a great view of the dependencies that existed in the organization. So some teams found it really difficult to pull the work the whole way through the system. They kept getting blocked on the same things. And, um, you know, it could, or, you know, they were dependent on the same things. It could be a particular skill set or something that they had, didn't have that they needed. And that gave a great opportunity for leadership to look to maybe reorganize some of the teams and actually, you know, distribute some of the skill sets in order to get kind of a better run through, through the board and actually be able to, you know, release the value. Um, another thing to point out on this board is when we, like, this board didn't start out looking like this, it certainly evolved to be this. And, you know, at the beginning when all of the work was there, there was so much of it, it was hard to kind of see in all of this work, what's important, you know, what are the most important problems we're going after? And in CDT, we use the term rocks. So rocks for us are just the game changers. That's the stuff that we think is really going to move the needle for our customers. And we visualize that. And that enabled the teams, you know, to start actually making trade-offs towards those things. If these are the most important things to move, the team started trading off to try and, you know, move those things across. Uh, so we, we run a weekly stand-up across the whole organization on this board. I, I took a little screen grab from this Tuesday stand-up. Um, that's what it looks like now. And look, for us, I suppose we had to tackle the problem of remoteness pretty early on because we are a remote team, right? We've teams based in Dublin and we've teams based in the US. So it hasn't been that much of a shift since we've all had to go fully remote. Um, so from that kind of stage that, that, that like, you know, visualizing the organization as a whole, we learned a lot. I mean, we could now see what we previously couldn't see. We could see problems that were previously hidden. Uh, just on the last point here though, for us, like a lot of our teams were kind of working in a silo. They, they didn't necessarily know what all of the other 12 teams were working on. They didn't necessarily get a sense of being part of that larger system or being part of a larger team. So now the teams had an opportunity where they could see what else was going on. They could also, there was more opportunities there to kind of, you know, ask for help if you needed it, but also offer it if you could, you know. So particularly on the rocks, if there was something there where somebody um, was working on a piece of the rock and needed help, that they could put that ask out to other teams. So we started to see more of that. And we started to see things move along. Um, there's a bit of a pattern in my talk where I'm going to talk to some of the successes and then immediately uh, some of the mistakes that we made. I I'm talking a lot about systems and, you know, the system is not the board. The system is not the tool. The system is the people, right? All of the people on those 13 teams that work together to deliver the value. And the truth of it is, you know, in our enthusiasm to get going with this new system, we left some people behind. Um, it was very evident in the stand-ups that people were confused or people found it difficult to move through the workflow because they didn't necessarily understand the workflow. And we realized that although we thought we'd been clear on the intent, we hadn't been, right? We, people were confused, there was complete misalignment. Uh, Stand-ups were hard because people just couldn't figure out what was going on. So we ended up doing an offsite. Uh, we took, all of the leadership team came out for two days. 
uh, leadership across development, across product, across design, across architecture. And I suppose look, what we were trying to do is like, again, this is back to basics, right? Kanban, like, you know, the, the policies, we hadn't actually defined the policies together for how work will move through the system. And I think it's really hard to try and improve something if you're not all on the same page, right? Because if you're not all looking at the same thing to start with, it's going to be impossible or very, very difficult to try and evolve that. So that's what we did, right? We went back to basics. It's kind of infamous in CDT. We called it the policy party. I think no one wants to come to a party that I ever throw <laughs> again. But um, look, it was really, it, because we were so misaligned, we had to come back together and get aligned. And that's what we did. So we emerged with that sense of alignment and defined all the policies for how work would move through that system. Um, in my experience, when you're trying to maybe look to optimize an organization as a whole, you absolutely need buy-in from senior leadership to do that, right? Uh, it, it's impossible really to do without that. But you also have to bring the teams with you because the teams are the people doing the work. And I think, you know, across a group of 90 people, for sure, not everybody was going to be interested in this, right? Not everybody wanted to maybe drive this, but there are always people out there in an organization and you need to find them. And that's what we did. We went out and we found people who were interested, who wanted to kind of be part of this and champion it. And they got together, they called themselves the, the process advocates and um, affectionately known as avocados for some reason in CDT. Um, but their role is really to, you know, champion this concept of being part of that larger system of, you know, helping to look for the bottlenecks in that larger system to, you know, like these guys are all experienced in using Kanban because they used it on their own teams. So they're also there to kind of challenge leadership about what they see and, and help coach leadership about some of those concepts and things that maybe worked in their team that could actually work in that larger system too. So, you know, we felt like we had more leadership alignment. We had that, you know, the buy-in from the, the teams as well and people who wanted to drive it from the teams. But so we kind of felt like for the first time we could actually start, right? This is months and months in, but like we kind of felt like, okay, now we can actually get somewhere. But we wanted to make sure that we avoided being in that place, place of complete misalignment again, right? And like all 90 people make up part of the system. So all 90 people have a stake in the game and have a say in the system. So we created this forum where once a month, anybody can come from the organization and talk to what they've seen in the system. And maybe there's a problem in the system they want to address. Maybe there's an experiment that they want to run. And we get together and, and we discuss that. People put forward proposals and then we vote on it. And then you know we're kind of collectively changing the system we're not doing that no one person in isolation can evolve the system and sort of change the game for everybody else um you might ask like how on earth do you make decisions across 90 people it's difficult we've definitely tried a few different frameworks that's probably a whole other talk but if you're interested i'm more than happy to share with you later on um so again from that kind of phase what do we learn look some of these things are are very, very obvious, but you know, look, we, we made these mistakes and if anybody else is embarking on a similar journey or even in the middle of it, like, you know, these things are so important in terms of, like I said, I can't iterate enough, the people, the people, the people, it's the people that do the work. It's, it's not the system, it's not the tools. And I think be very, very deliberate about change management. Uh, don't forget the, the basics, you know, follow the practices and look on the, the flip side of it. Like once we kind of got to that point of alignment, we started to see work move through the system, right? People understood it. People were trying to move the things that needed to be moved. And we started to see some success out of that. But here's the pattern. <laughs> As we started to see things flow through the system, uh, we started to ask ourselves, look, what are these things, right? You know, are these, these kind of features that are moving through that board, like where are they coming from? Why are we choosing to solve these problems over other problems? What makes this problem so important to solve? And I think fundamentally what we were asking ourselves is how do we make decisions as an organization, right? Like how do we decide what to work on? And then the other side of it, you know, once things were gone to production, we started kind of maybe a bad habit of we would clap when something moved to finish and it was in production. And then the team would go and pull in the next problem. But, you know, that stuff that had gone to production, we weren't necessarily validating. Well, hang on, has that actually, has that problem been solved? You know, are the customers using it? Are they happy with it? Do we have feedback? Do we know, you know, is the problem solved? Do we need to do more? We also had an issue where some of the, the features on the board were actually taking a very long time. Like they were sitting on the board for a really, really long time. It felt like they had a long tail. And I think that was because we weren't necessarily good at defining what done was. You know, teams were just working more in the problem space because they could, not necessarily because they should. So we felt like, look, this, this board that we've mapped out, I think there's more of an upstream piece to this and there's more of a downstream piece. So let's go and let's try and map that out. 
so that's what we did. Uh, we did another couple of days where we started to, we did a workshop around mapping out the upstream workflow and the downstream workflow. And we were smarter this time. We actually set out the policies and we did that together. And what we emerged with was this, um, it's really a board that reflects how we make decisions as an organization. Uh, it's called the strategy board. I would actually say it's a bit of a misnomer. I think of it more as like it's the ideation funnel. So what we're trying to do is think about from the beginning, do we have enough data to support that this is a good problem space to go after and show it to each other, right? Show it to everybody. And at every stage, continue to validate, do we have enough data to show that this is a good problem space to go after? We're also trying to set out what good looks like up front and know that we can put measures in place to, you know, when it's in production, actually assess, well, have we actually had the impact that we thought it was going to have? You know, do we know when we're done? So kind of over on the right hand side there in launch and validating, we have things in there like, you know, when something's in production after a couple of days, we should be able to tell, is it being used or not? Right. Uh, after a couple of weeks, who's using it and how much after a couple of months? What interesting patterns are there? Can we declare that like, yeah, that's victory. Like, yeah, we've we've moved the needle the way we wanted to. Or actually, is there more to do and be much more deliberate about assessing, you know, are we actually solving the customer problems? Um, for us, or for me as an agile coach, right, like I spent so much of my career talking about and, and thinking about and trying to optimize the flow of work in teams. But I guess, you know, if you're trying to optimize the flow of the wrong thing, um, that's probably not a great space to be in. And I think for me, these are probably the two most fundamental questions I would ask considering, you know, going into any new organization. I think these are the questions that are most fundamental to get answers to. And they're very hard to get answers to sometimes, right? You can ask people, you'll talk to leadership and say, hey, do, do we know like that we're working on the most important customer problems? How do we know? Uh, and you might get, sure, sure. But when you try to prove that out and you map out that workflow, it can be quite difficult. So these are two questions I think are fundamental to, to ask ourselves. So here's where we've ended up. We've tried to make the intangible tangible. We've tried to model our whole system of work in terms of, you know, from ideation to where it comes in and the teams pull it in and start to work on it. And then the teams themselves break that work down on their own kind of team boards and manage that work, manage the flow of work there. But look, to me, there's no such thing as like, it's a, we've reached a problem free state, right? I think it's more about choosing what problems you wanna have. And for us, you know, some of the problems we're trying to tackle now is I think we're starting to see that we need to zoom out even another level. Um, I mentioned the rocks and, you know, those rocks are kind of more like program level work and we don't necessarily have great visibility of that. So we're talking about going up even another level and creating a higher level of abstraction and actually start to see those programs of work. So I think that's, that's more to come. That's what's coming next. Um, hopefully some of you guys who are here and listening to this, hopefully you're still listening and <laughs> have maybe, you know, you've been on a journey that's similar or some of you are thinking about, you know, yeah, I would like to embark on a journey like this or, or we're thinking about these things too. And, you know again i don't there's loads of different frameworks out there that can help you but like for me it's about doing and for from the story i just told you in cdt like we learned a lot and but it kind of coughed and spluttered to life and we weren't necessarily following any kind of particular process um but having done that and now some other organizations in workday have reached out for help and i'm helping them on this and this is kind of how i would approach it this is how i think about it and i think hopefully this could be useful if you're thinking about doing something similar um, start with visualizing the work across all the teams. So if you're going into an organization, you want to do something like this, something similar to, you know, going out to each of the teams and seeing what are the current features, problem faces, epics, whatever your favorite term is that you're working on and get all of those on the board. You know, I think the lens you apply there is very important because I'm not advocating for going and getting every single story from every single team and putting it on a board. It's more about, you know, going up a level, trying to see that, that bigger level, that, that higher level view. Um, and then agree a stand up on it, you know, get the right people talking to it. Uh, to, there's a kind of caveat to this where it, it, this can, I've seen these stand ups kind of devolve into almost like a status update, right? People come in and they feel like it's for management or they have to kind of give a status to where the thing is at. I think that's a bad place to end up in. You're, you're trying to encourage people to talk about the system as a whole, talk about what they see. Does the system look overloaded? Do they see bottlenecks? Where are those bottlenecks? encourage people to challenge each other's work as well you know and where that's at because you're trying to get people to bust out of their silo and start to look at the organization as a whole um after that then i'd say look inevitably there's going to be a lot of work there and i think 
the next step is trying to align on, look, within all of the work that's here, what are the most important problems to go after? You know, like, could you name even, could you get people to align on a top three? You know, what are the, in all of this stuff, what are the things that really matter the most? What are the game changers? What, what are the things we want the teams to go after? Um, because again, once you do that, and if you make that visual, like the, the teams will make, the teams are making trade-offs every day, but they will start to trade off towards those things that are the most important. And you don't have to run around and micromanage teams and, you know, give the teams information and they'll use it. So I think that's hugely important. And then lastly, look for, for, for systems like this. What these systems are about is like you visualize it to be able to see the problems that were previously hidden. And these systems are only so good as, you know, having the people who are willing to see those problems and willing to talk to them and challenge them. And you need a forum for that, right? You need a forum where if people, you know, ideally what you're trying to do is improve the system and make changes to that system. And you need a forum for that where people can collectively, you know, discuss these things, challenge each other and, and make agreements to, to make changes to the system. Um, anecdotally, like this is not a couple of weeks of work, right? Like this takes months and months, I would say, each of these stages to get comfortable with, you know, getting the lay of the land, get comfortable with the stand-ups and then start to build towards that alignment of what the most important problems are. Uh, probably hammering home some of these points, but yeah, look, for me as a coach, I think go in and try and start at the highest level you can in terms of solving the problems. I'm not, like those questions are hard to ask, you know, in terms of like, are we solving the most important customer problems? Um, but they're not, they're easy to ask, but they're hard to answer. And, you know, do we know that we're actually really solving those customer problems? Uh, people, 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 like you can't, people are the change. You can't do anything without people. Just be very deliberate about bringing people on that journey. As a leader, you can't overstate your intent enough, I don't think, in terms of doing something like this. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely not going to get it right first time. I know like I shared some of the mistakes we made with you guys. I'm not a big fan of being prescriptive about like, there's loads of different scaling frameworks and things out there, but I think you have to take bits of things and try things and figure out what works for you. And, you know, be willing to fail at things and try something else because it's, it's it, I, I don't believe, like we've ended up with an amalgamation of so many different models, so many different things. Um, I've kind of put this in for anyone who needs to hear it. I know I, I would have liked to have heard it at some point, but it is hard, right? This stuff is hard. There was definitely times where we were doing this where I felt like, oh man, I just want to go back to the way it was, even though like blissful ignorance was sometimes a bit blissful. <laughs> and once you lift that rock up, there's a temptation sometimes you just want to put it back down. but push through it, right? Like it, it's hard to change, it's hard to kind of innovate, it's hard to transform something. And that is that just kind of price your pain to get to the next stage. So if anybody out there does feel like that, I just wanted to let you know it's all right. Um, it's okay to feel like that. And you just push through because the spoils are on the other side. I think that's the price of jumping to that new curve. Having said that, as hard as it is, you don't need to be a martyr. Like you can take help and there's plenty out there. I really just want to call, call out these guys because whether they know it or not, they've been the most helpful to us in our journey. Um, Klaus, I went on his Enterprise Kanban coaching course and Jose and JP, like all of our team leads and all of our uh, advocates actually went on their KMP training course. And look, what these guys actually have in common is they, they, don't, te or they don't tell, they teach you, right? And I think that's a big distinction and they're, they're not overly prescriptive about things. They highly encourage you to think for yourself and I just came away with like an abundance of thoughts, <laughs> especially if you're in that place where you're like, oh man, this is getting too hard. It's always worth kind of taking a couple of days out, going and thinking and talking to other people because sometimes you can feel like you're on a bit of an island. And actually that's to my last point. I, I sometimes feel like us in Workday, in our little organization in Workday, you know, sometimes it feels like we're, I know there's loads of other people out there doing these things. And I was really heartened to see like tomorrow. I know like even today I've heard loads of things, but tomorrow as well, there's like flight levels from the trenches and. I'm really here to tell my story. I think we're all humans and we just want to tell each other stories and try and help each other. But I'd love to hear some of your stories too, because um, I know there's other people out there who can help with these things. And I always have my swag bag ready to steal some great ideas. So I'll be around in Sokoko for the rest of the afternoon. If anybody wants to have a chat, hear more about this story or wants to tell me their story, I'm all ears. I'd love to hear it. Um, so that's it. I think I've kind of flown through that. <laughs> Hopefully I've lived left enough time for questions if there are any. Just a question from Abby there I saw. Uh, so how do you prevent board reviews from being status updates? That's a really good question. Um, I think part of it is about the intent, you know, what I was talking about in terms of getting leaders to, to really talk to the intent because I, I think it can devolve quite quickly in terms of if you don't give people the context for what you're trying to do, and people are kind of, you know, 
in this kind of session where like everybody's there, right? Like from the most senior leaders to the most junior people in the organization. And that can be quite intimidating for people if they feel like they're going in to speak in front of leadership. And so I think part of that hugely is about the intent and about kind of creating that safe space. And part of that as well is about what gets talked about and what gets praised. You know, I mean, we really try to really, really praise the, the teams that are coming forward and asking for help, right? Because that's not a bad thing. It's, you know, a team is saying, hey, our, you know, like our burn up is flatlining, we need help. And, and I think it's more about, you know, the things that you, you celebrate and the things that you kind of, when anybody challenges something, you, you again, you know, you call that out as a real success. Um, so I think it's, it's about kind of building that culture up slowly, but surely that it's a safe space to come in and challenge each other. Um, I would also say like, you know, just trying to do away with any sort of status updates, like the, the questions that you set in, in the, the session and asking people to, what's kind of works well sometimes as well as to, ask people to kind of, you know, almost give the update for other people and, and try to get them to kind of work together on it.